the whole idea of this uh, webinar is to find out what data that we need to collect uh, to successfully monitor our machine learning models in production. And we're gonna talk data collection pre and post deployment. Um, and the agenda for today, how we're gonna go about is that we're gonna start with the end in mind, uh, which means why do we need machine learning monitoring? What's model failure? Uh, and also what is the ideal machine learning monitoring workflow that you need to follow? And we at NANIML were quite opinionated about that workflow. Uh, and that workflow is also gonna be the guide, uh, the guidance throughout the presentation. So we'll not be looking at what data do we have together and then what can we do with it? But we're gonna look at it from the way, which things do we have to do to successfully monitor? And then which of these things require what data? Um, and before we can do that, we'll quickly discuss how we can go from training to production. Just a few minutes, we'll create a diagram together and that's gonna be like um, the guidance, the red, um, the silver lining that we will have to follow. And then we'll touch upon performance monitoring and the different parts of that. And then we'll go into root cause analysis, which for us is the data drift detection algorithms uh, that, we'll, uh, that we'll use to then kind of see if there is a drop in performance, uh, what are the possible causes, and we'll use data drift for that. And then we'll dive in together. And at the end, there's a Q&A. Um, and I hope I'll be able to power through this presentation and we can spend some time together uh, answering your questions. So. Um, starting with the end in mind, uh, which is why do we need machine learning monitoring? And then also what is the ideal workflow to do machine learning monitoring? I'd love to uh, refer to a paper that we recently discovered. It's from a few months ago. Um, it's temporal quality degradation in AI models. And it's basically a paper that got published in Nature. Um, and they did a very elaborate data science experiment on 32 data sets across four industries. Uh, and they built four models for all of these 32 data sets. And then they ran 20,000 experiments uh, per data set pair. Um, and what they actually realized in this experiment is that 91% of models degrade after they've been deployed in production. Uh, and I would highly recommend that if you're interested in machine learning model and uh, uh, machine learning models and deploying them and post deployment data science, I highly recommend that you. I read this paper, it's very accessible, um, but the concept that it touch upon and the proof that it provides for things that basically we as NaniML have been saying right now for a few years already of what happens and what we've seen in practice backed up by some theory. So that's very nice. Um, my father will share the link uh, inside of the chat so that you can, yeah, guys can have a look. Uh, so one minute how the experiment is set up. Uh, what they do is that basically they take a time series data set across various industries. Uh, which goes from healthcare, uh, transportation, finance. Uh, and then they sample one window of training data, one a year worth of training data. And then they kind of construct like uh, an artificial window, which they call the age of the machine learning model, which is the difference between when the model was deployed and trained uh, and when it's actually making inference and making predictions. And that difference between that, that's the age. And then they just sample again, uh, some data uh, in production. And that is three things that they then create. And they do that 20,000 times for all of these different data sets and all of these different models. And then they kind of measure uh, the difference in performance um, between those two. And that is what you see, or the relative performance actually. And that is what you see on this chart. And there is two major conclusions, which is as the age of the machine learning model goes up, it's assuming that there is no uh, retraining, just the model staying static. Um, the, the error increases, so the performance deteriorates, and also the model, er model error variability goes up, which is also something very interesting to observe, is that how these different models, it's like random forest gradient boosting, I think rich regression and neural network, how they react um, to um, the, the data and, and the aging as well is also very different. Um, and that is also something that we've been noticing in practice. Uh, so. Read this paper <laughs> if you're interested in it. But basically, the takeaway point is like our models are gonna are gonna fail in production if we do nothing. And when that is happening, uh, we need to find out and go and resolve it. And how we're gonna go about that? This is kind of our monitoring flow. Is that we are really obsessed about performance. And performance 
and monitoring specifically is the key part of our workflow. Um, and the question that we have to uh, we'll have to answer is like our model still performing well? And if there is performance degradation, then we will go into the data drift, which we consider part of root cause analysis. So that is detecting distribution shifts and looking how features change. And so that we then can come up with a plausible reason why the performance has deteriorated. And if we have established what went wrong, we then can go into fix it. That might be automated as well. Um, and that's going to be retraining the model, refactoring the use case, changing down uh, stream business processes, or falling back to a previous model checkpoint. And this whole performance monitoring, there's three parts to it, which is measuring the business impact, calculating the realized performance, and then also estimating performance. And estimating performance is specifically something uh, for which we have spent a lot of time developing, al developing algorithms, and that we will do when the ground truth is delayed and we can't calculate realized performance, but more uh, about those things when we actually get to it. But that's kind of the workflow, the, the ideal monitoring workflow uh, that will follow where we obsess over performance. Um, some quick words about um, developing a machine learning model and putting it into production. Um, so very simple, we start with some training data, uh, which also includes uh, or a learning set, which includes the validation data. We feed it to an algorithm, we create a model, and then we apply this model on a test set. And if we're satisfied with the results, then we take this model and we put it in production. The most straightforward way of deploying is just to put it behind an API and create a prediction service. If you're using a machine learning model and you just use a script where you then make some type of predictions, if there is people or businesses or decisions being taken on these predictions, then technically your machine learning model is in production and you need to be monitoring it. Even though it's like not formally um, architected or programmed or checked off by IT, it is being used in the real world, so it is in production. But here for simplification, we just put our model uh, inside of an API and that process is deploying it. And then when it's really in production, we have the business process. For instance, we might be doing churn prediction uh, where we send some data to our prediction service about our customers. And we, then we get some model output back, the probability to churn. Uh, and this business process would then be uh, the retention process. So we will then later take some uh, retention measurements based on the model outputs. And these are downstream processes that happen after the prediction uh, is being made. And that is something important to bear in mind that making predictions is never the end point. A machine learning model is always embedded in a business process. Uh, so there is more data that we can gather later on. Uh, for instance, we can gather some business KPIs or we can gather information uh, about which retention campaigns are working very well. And at the end, we can also gather some information whether the customer actually ended up churning or not. So these are like the components uh, that, that are connected inside of our production environment. Of course, we as data scientists, uh, but also executives, model owners, data engineers, ML engineers, we want to get some view, get some observability of how this entire system is doing. So that's why we have a monitoring system. And the first thing that we will have to know is, is our API actually working? Are we being able to make predictions? Uh, and that is infrastructure and application monitoring. That's not going to be the focus of uh, this presentation at all, because this is something uh, monitoring APIs and the resources that APIs consume um, and the application itself. It's like something that is very well established and that problem is basically already solved. So we're not going to be focusing on that. Uh, but it, that is all about, uh, are we not running out of memory? Are, is our uh, hardware being efficiently used? Uh, and also inside of the, in, inside of the API itself, do, do we uh, is our code still working? Uh, don't we have any bugs? And when there's issues here, these tend to fail very loudly. In a sense, there is already monitoring for that. There is already best practices. If our API stops working, we will get notified, or at least uh, the ops team will. Um, so, just like a quick reminder of how su such a typical application monitoring dashboard looks like, like a research management, basically and how many API calls, et cetera. But not the focus of today. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on what goes into the monitoring system from a data science perspective so that we can assess over the model performance. Inside of our monitoring system, there's typically four components, which is the logging of the data, the collecting, 
and then also the analytics part. Um, that's going to be like the performance estimation, the data drift detection, which is tied to some alerting. If something is going down, we have to be notified and we'll send some information, some alerts to the users. Uh, and then we would also ideally have some dashboard where we or some reporting uh, where we can look into the issues, explore some data, do some data science and bring everything together and actually uh, come up with the plausible root cause analysis. Um, and specifically for today, we're gonna be focusing on which data we need to be collecting and also why. So, and the why is uh, from a methodological perspective, what type of analytics do we need to be carrying out and what data do we need for that? Uh, and one way of looking at this entire setup is that it's more like a real-time monitoring analysis because if you hook up your monitoring system inside of production, uh, what you will be saying is what is happening with my models right now. That is not really something that is part of the open source uh, NaniML library. That is more uh, what we offer in our managed service. Uh, but since we're focusing on the analytics and the logging, that is, or at least the, the analytics part, that is part of our open source library. Uh, so you would still be able with everything that you will learn today here about the data, you would still be able to use NaniML open source uh, to kind of figure out what happened with my models in the past. But if you want to know what's happening right now and do real-time analysis, you'll have to like um, integrate or deploy the open source library in production. Um, but then again, like the open source library contains all the analytics and, and, and the managed service that is NaniML, um, it takes care of the multi-model view, bringing a lot of use cases together at in, in a single uh, observability view and really getting performance across your entire production environment and then some engineering that's being taken care of, like uh, easy to deploy, uh, configurable, collecting and connecting to your data, intelligent alerting, and then automated issue resolution as well. But not the focus of today. Today, we're focusing on the data to collect and what we uh, need this data for. And so that's gonna be generalized as well to any, uh, to the open source solution um, and yeah, actually also to our managed service, but to any other monitoring solution that you might have like uh, your own. Um, and now we'll be using, now that we've established like our view of our monitoring uh, diagram, we can go through these components and then use that diagram to see which data that we need. And we're gonna be talking realized performings how we are going to monitor that, how we can be do benchmarking, what we have to do when the ground truth is delayed, um, and how we can estimate the performance. Um, so first thing about business impact monitoring, I'm bringing it up because it's really important as part of obsessing over that performance. Um, but we will have a dedicated webinar for that in a few weeks. So stay tuned for that. I'll give a quick example of which uh, might or something that might be part of it. But we can, for instance, uh, if we get the predictions of our machine learning model and we get a cost matrix, we can combine both and we can kind of create an expected value and really put monetary value on what our machine learning models are bringing in. And that uh, has a lot of advantages because that's one metric to track. Uh, we can set thresholds that are being driven by actual business value. Um, but again, it's not a part of today's webinar, but just for sake of completeness, uh, I'm mentioning it. So what are we gonna focus on is like uh, the technical performance. So that are like all of the machine learning model metrics. And just a small reminder that if we wanna measure performance, what we will do is we will take the model output, the predictions and compare them with the target or the ground truth. And then if we're in classification, if we're uh, correct, then that was a good prediction. And for regression, if we're almost correct, then we're also happy with how our regression model is performing. Um, of course, when we're in production, our API is predicting over time. So that's gonna be temporal data and we're not gonna be looking at performance on instance level, but we're gonna aggregate this, um, meaning that we will create a metric that will take all of these um, observations into account as time goes on. Um, and so for our monitoring system, which data that we will need to be gathering to measure the realized performance is that we will need the predictions 
So what comes out of the machine learning model and then later downstream the targets. And then we can uh, put that in an NML performance calculator and we can get the performance up. And of course, like I said before, it's a temporal analysis. That means we're getting data over time and we'll have to somehow in a way aggregate that data to know, for instance, in this case, we're making daily predictions and we kind of want to know what the performance is per month. So we'll have to apply some aggregation uh, methodology here where we will take this array of predicted probabilities um, in this entire month and compare it with the target is in, in this entire month. And then we get the single uh, data points of um, metric values for rock AC for an entire month. And this part is called chunking. And how we chunk has a lot of uh, implications. So I'll delve, delve into that a little bit here. Um, because we can uh, chunk by months, but we can also chunk by daily. Uh, this is here on the, on the left, it's a classification uh, metric and on the right, it's a regression metric. And we use the step plot for this uh, because basically the step plot here for the month January, it is the performance that is actually uh, present in this entire month aggregated. Um, and how we can go about chunking monthly compared to daily is that we have, oops, is that we have time-based chunking, size-based chunking, and number-based chunking. So if you would look at your observations, uh, if you would group them all by day, uh, then your daily chunking, you can do it by week, by month. Uh, but you could also say like, I want all of my, every thousand API calls, I want them to be one chunk and have performance over those thousand API calls. And that would be size-based uh, chunking. And we could also just say, if we're looking at our production data uh, at some point, then we just say, we just want two, four, five, or 10 chunks, um, then we can uh, use the number-based chunking for it. And chunking has some implications in the sense that I uh, imagine that with, with regards to the actual stability of the metrics and the aggregations that we do over the periods. For instance, if we're doing um, a chunk size, which is rather small, and we have also very unbalanced classes, it might be that in some of the chunks, we don't get the minority class. And if we don't have the minority class present in some of these chunks, then we can't measure uh, combinatory metrics like for instance, rock AOC. So that is something very important to think about uh, when you pick the right way of chunking. And then there is another thing, which is also super interesting. And we're just doing group buys, but these things tend to become very complex very fast, is that um, there is this error that can occur, which has nothing to do with data drift and which has nothing to do with concept drift, but which is just plain sampling. Um, so basically that how the data is generated over time, if you have, for instance, risky customers, and they just by sheer chance happen to do something very close in time, uh, then they will be put in the same chunk. And then that is going to impact the performance. And what you see here in this GIF is you have some population of data points. And every time we just randomly sample and we put them in a different chunk. And these are all valid performance patterns that they can form. So here we see like the performance is like first going down and then up. But then we can also just see that there is a million different ways that this chart can actually look. And this sampling error is something very important to take into account because we don't want to alert or we don't want to go and delve uh, and do a, a comprehensive analysis if our metrics are just changing um, because of sampling as opposed to something deeper going on. And that's why we are also, as part of our open source library, we have this baked in and we use the standard error for that but I'll touch upon that a little bit later. Um, maybe one word on how to pick the right chunking method for you. So first of all, it's these considerations that you have to make uh, when it comes to, to the small chunking and the stability of it. Uh, also the sampling error, the smaller your chunks are, um, uh, the less stable it's gonna be. But ideally you pick something that makes sense from a business perspective. If you're, uh, if you're evaluating your machine learning models every month, for instance, when it comes to churn, then you can just aggregate all of the information and your churn predictions over the entire month. Uh, if you have an API that is making daily predictions um, 
or fraud detection, then that is something that you might want to look at at a daily or even more specific at five minute interval. So it's really something that comes um, from uh, a business perspective, ideally. Um, okay, so back to this view where we can have our metrics over time, uh, where we have our classification metric and our regression metric. Uh, and what we will see is, are we doing any good? Like, that's the question what we have to ask here. Like, is our performance actually doing well? And we can set some thresholds ourselves based on intuition uh, or based on the business impact. Um, or we could compare uh, period over period, but then probably gradual performance deterioration would not get uh, detected. Uh, or maybe we can take the first few months of the production data as like a representative chunk. But ideally, that is a, it's not perfect. Um, so there is something else that we want to do if we want to do proper, print, uh, proper benchmarking, if we go back to the realized performance, is that we can actually get information from the test set. Because um, as a benchmark, um, the test set is actually... Uh, a great thing to use for it because it was specifically during development created to mimic the real life example and to mimic the real life scenario and thus the production data. And if there is um, performance issues or performance uh, divergence from the test sets, then that also probably most likely means that during development, there is something that we're missing and that that is impacting our machine learning models. So. This kind of um, leads to us having um, two very uh, important concepts, which is the reference and the analysis data. The analysis data means all the data that we have in the production. And then the reference is the data from the test set that we're going to use to benchmark, benchmark our performance against. So if we are going to then going to chunk uh, our performance against, against reference and analysis, it's just the same thing. Uh, but right now we just have an extra period for which we collect our metric. And then we can also visualize that over time. And we have something to compare our performance to. And we can set some thresholds based on some standard deviations, for instance, from the, from the mean performance. And then when the performance drops under that threshold, we can get alerted and we can see that there is an issue. And the same here for when we use a regression metric, if the error goes up, uh, then there's probably an issue and we want to delve in deeper. Now, in most cases, um, it's not going to be that, so, uh, that straightforward. And in this example, we can measure the realized performance because we have the targets in production. But in the majority of the use cases, an example of this could be actually um, if you buy a product online, if you recommend a product and then whether you buy that product, you almost instantly know whether your recommendation was successful. So the ground truth is almost instant. But often in reality, it's not the case and the ground truth is delayed. For instance, with the journalist example, it can take a few, uh, um, few months if your prediction window is like three or four or five months. It's going to take... Uh, some time for you to actually figure out whether those customers ended up churning or not. So then when you're making new predictions and you look back in the past, there is no visibility on the performance because you're still waiting for the ground truth to get realized. Same thing with loan defaults. You'll have to wait until the end of the term to actually know which customers um, ended up defaulting. And then there's also the case where there is absent ground truth. For instance, uh, with documents classification, if you have a lo lot of manual labors that label documents, you build a machine learning model and then you deploy it and there's no more label labeling happening, you actually don't know and there's no ground truth generated. So you can't get a view on the performance metric. And at the beginning in our workflow, I was saying uh, we need to obsess over performance. Um, but yeah, if there's no visibility on it, we can't. So this is a very, very, very serious problem. And that's why we developed a bunch of algorithms that can estimate performance. Uh, and I'll quickly show which data we need for those algorithms. But what these algorithms basically do is that when the ground truth is not available, we go and fetch data elsewhere so that we can still construct a view on performance so we're not in the dark. And then instead of measuring the realized performance and seeing whether it goes below the threshold, we just use the estimated performance. And then when there is an issue, we can go and figure out what went wrong. 
But what data do we need? Um, it depends uh, on what type of uh, problem we're solving. In the case of classification, if we go back to the performance calculation, we were getting the predictions and the targets uh, in, from the reference data. And then also in production, we were getting the predictions and the target to compare it with itself. But of course, in the case of delayed ground truth or absent ground truth, the target is not available. And this performance metric calculator is not going to be working. So we'll be using the confidence-based performance algorithm of NaniML, which is inside of the library. And we're not using the targets. And we will be leveraging the specifically the predicted probabilities uh, from the test set. So in the test set, we get the predictable probabilities, we get the targets. Um, and what we will do is we will uh, use the target to calibrate these probabilities if they aren't calibrated already, uh, because often it's just uh, model output scores that don't represent true probabilities. But if they do, then these probabilities have the uncertainty priced in and basically their confidence. And then we can construct, instead of a normal confusion matrix where we count the true positives, we can create an expected confusion matrix where we can put in the probability of an observation being a true positive. It's like a quick hack. I think my father can share in the chat um, like a link to one of the blog posts that explain this algorithm in detail. Um, but then we use this probability calibration that we've uh, learned from the test set and we can apply it on the probabilities in production. And then we can use this calculation trick to map it to performance. Um, and then we can get this view, even though there is no ground truth uh, in production coming in. And we just feed it the predicted probabilities uh, in production. We feed it to the algorithm that has been fitted on the reference data, uh, and we can get an estimation for our performance. Now, per regression, um, it's slightly different. It's a different algorithm. So if you go back to classification, we take the test set, uh, and this is kind of the, the data that we derive from it, and we just take the predicted probabilities. Uh, for estimating regression performance, uh, we're going slightly different about it because um, a point estimate has no sense of confidence of uncertainty priced in, in the estimate itself. So we will get also the features from the test set. Um, and then also uh, in production, what goes into the machine learning model, we will also collect that and feed that to the monitoring system. And then inside of the monitoring system, we will uh, give that information to the DLE algorithm that we have, which is direct loss estimation. And what that algorithm will do is that it will take the reference data, it will uh, create an error based on the predictions and the target. So basically just subtracting, uh, subtracting it and then um, taking the absolute value of it so that it uh, becomes a loss and not an error. And then we will use these features inside of the test sets to build a machine learning model. And then this machine learning model with these features is gonna be predicting the loss that we just created. Then we take this model, we deploy it in production. And then when we are in production, we just feed it um, the new features and also actually the predictions because we also have access to that. That is also a feature uh, inside of the DLE algorithm. And then we can estimate the loss and we can get a view on our metric uh, just like how we did with classification. Um, and that way we're not dependent on the ground truth to come in and on realized performance to get a view of how our machine learning models are doing. I think my father can also share an article specifically about how this DLE algorithm works. Um, but I'm not gonna delve into that uh, much further. So quick recap about performance monitoring uh, and which features that uh, we're actually using uh, and what data they are consuming. So technically we don't really need the timestamp because we can also do the size-based chunking, but it's always good practice um, because mostly when you look from a business per perspective to do chunking, it's gonna be mostly about the time-based chunking. Um, and then for realized performance, we need the predictions and the target for both reference and analysis. And then if the estimated performance, we don't have the targets. Um, so we're gonna be leveraging the predicted probabilities uh, for classification and then for regression, we're just leveraging um, the model outputs and using the features um, inside training and inside of the test set and then also in production itself. All right. Um, so after we've established 
that there is a drop in performance and only if there is an actual drop in performance, then we will go uh, to the root cause analysis, which are all of our drift detection uh, methods. And then we can use that to kind of find out uh, what went wrong uh, so that we can uh, take the uh, appropriate um, resolution. So first thing to do is um, when it comes to drift is distribution monitoring. Um, and that is just taking our features, feeding it into the monitoring system. And then inside of the monitoring system, same thing as before, we will be doing chunking. Um, and then in every single chunk, we will just do a distribution calculation on all of the observations that are part of it. So we get something like this for continuous features. And then for category features, we will have the different um, distribution of categories uh, per month. Uh, as well. And here's the same thing for um, for distribution monitoring as before in performance, like, is this good? Like, are these distributions any different? So again, for drift detection, we need to establish some kind of reference from which we can compare how our distributions are changing. And again, we're going to be using the test sets for it, uh, because the test set mimics this uh, uh, ideal circumstance of how our model should be working and it's specifically designed for that. So we'll be taking the features from the test sets and then what we can do is we can use um, the reference periods or the test sets to kind of run our uh, distance metrics and our statistical tests and then um, we can see here for instance for this distance metric we set a threshold and if the, uh, the distance metric is above it um, then that is an alert. Um, and when the statistical test is significant, then that is also an alert. Um, and that is what exactly what we see here. Of course, this doesn't really tell us how the features are chaining. So then we're going to overlay that drift detection over the distributions. And then we can really see here this feature. Uh, it's really shifted upwards. Uh, and it just became higher over time. Here, what we see for the categorical feature here in this month, we also have an alert these distributions don't look that distinct. Uh, and this is a downside of these statistical tests and this univariate feature detection is that they're very sensitive. And we're applying these statistical tests like period over period. And they are just going to throw like weird alarms like this. And if this feature is not important to the model, we don't want to be alerted by this. And that is why we first do the performance obsession and then we do the data drift detection. And only when there's a drop in performance, we are going to go and delve in the data drift detection, uh, because else we will just get too many false alarms and too much alert fatigue um, going on here. Um, we can also do the multivariate data drift detection, which basically follows the same way. We just pick our features up um, that go into the model in production, and then we compare them um, to our uh, features that were inside of the test sets. Uh, and we compare specifically, we've developed an algorithm for this as well, um, which is based on a PCA, maybe Mafalda, you can also share the link, the link for this one. So what we do is we use the reference data, uh, we take all of the features, we fit a PCA object on it, and then we take that data and we push it through the uh, compression and then the decompression so that the data basically recreates itself through this transformation, and then we measure the error. And when it's applied on the same data or data that has the same structure, this error is going to be very low. But when the data structures and the relationship between the data are changing, then this error is going to be increasing. And that is then a clear sign that this data set has, uh, is fundamentally different than before. Uh, and again, if we want to do the univariate data drift detection uh, that I mentioned before, as opposed to taking all features, we just take one feature. Now, there's two other ways of drift that we can also do, which are fairly popular, uh, which is prediction drift. It's the same thing. We do the univariate drift detection where we get the predictions from the test set as a reference. And then from in production, we also fetch the predictions. And we push it through the same um, univariate drift calculator. We do the same uh, data drift detection. And what we will then see is things like this. Um, this is actually specifically a visualization um, from the last webinar where we analyzed the taxi green data sets. And the reason I put it up here is because we don't see a change 
in the model output, yet there was really a drop in performance. And that is again a drawback of these statistical methods. Uh, and just measuring the distribute how the distribution change of your machine learning model is not enough. That's also why I'm adding this more as something to think about. Um, and the same thing applies to target drift. When the target gets, gets available, when it gets generated, we can also take them, push them through the univariate drift calculator, uh, and then kind of get, get a view um, on whether the, whether the distribution is changing over time. Uh, and here specifically, inside of um, where we are, where we are. Uh, uh, here inside of uh, the target, we see again that both the, that the target distribution hasn't changed either. It's from the same uh, data set that we dis that we discussed in the previous webinar, and we also see that there is like no prediction drift. But again, we had some performance issue, even though the target distribution stayed stayed the same. Uh, stayed the same. So again, these methods are not really the most reliable, and that is why uh, obsessing over performance. Uh, is better than just uh, obsessing over a single univariate uh, metric. So quick recap for root cause analysis. Um, we do this root cause analysis when there is a drop in performance. There's various ways that we can detect uh, data drift. And then we will look at these data drift. We will look at the features. We will see how they change and what their relationship is with regards to the targets so that we can then actually know what went really wrong and why our performance is deteriorating. Uh, and basically um, how this mapping works is that in the reference, we just take either the features for multivariate drift, for feature drift, we take one feature, and then for prediction and target, we just use the prediction and the target and we do the univariates. And in analysis, we gather the same data. So this type of, uh, root cause analysis and the data drift detection requires more forwards. Uh, it's a little bit more straightforward um, than the performance estimation. Now, to top it off, quickly uh, tying everything together, we had a look at this architecture diagram. Um, so what has to go into the monitoring system? It's very important to establish a good reference for which we recommend to use in the test set. Then we can take the model inputs um, that we can straight get from the, app, uh, from the prediction service. Also, ideally, some information about the API itself, the model outputs, and then more downstream gathering business KPIs and the target if it's available. Then there is also some other uh, information that has to go inside of the monitoring system, which is the configuration. Um, which metrics, which thresholds, how are we going to set our thresholds, how are we going to set up our alerting rules. Um, of course, you can always set the user defaults um, and, and kind of roll with that. But every use case is different. And the key is to customize the monitoring solution to the use case. And you also have to schedule when you will be running, what your chunking strategy will be. Um, so there is a little bit of configuration to do, specifically if you want uh, for it to be customized. One thing we didn't touch upon, which is uh, the model file itself and the model artifacts, you can store them. But we don't think you necessarily need them to carry out advanced monitoring analysis. And we actually specifically do not focus on the model file yet. We might in the future. But today, model files are very different. Models themselves are also um, very different. And it's much more powerful to um, build algorithms that are model agnostic. And that don't require and that work basically out of the, out of the box for any type of machine learning model, and that is exactly what what inside of the NaniML library uh, has been has been done right now. Um, we're mostly been talking about which data goes in to the monitoring system. Of course, there is also data going out, which is the alerts and the insights to our users. And then if we want to close the loop, we can also set up automated issue resolution based on the type of alerts and the performance drops that we experience. Uh, but this becomes more complex, and that is also data that we will have to be gathering. Because if we do this automatically, then we're basically going from monitoring one model to monitoring a use case to then monitoring an entire MLOps pipeline um, that has retraining and that also potentially uh, creates feedback loops. And then, of course, 
we also have to be storing our runs and any information with regards to the alerts uh, and, and data that is being created inside of the monitoring application itself. Now, if you wanna use the open source library to do some analysis on your machine learning models that you already have running in production, there's a quick way to do that, which is you can um, take the reference data, which is the test sets, uh, make sure that you have some timestamps for when um, these observations were relevant, then the model output and the target. You take your production data. You don't need necessarily need the target in production, but you do need the model input and then the model output also when the predictions were being made. And then later when your analysis uh, when your analysis data becomes available, like the targets in production, uh, you can also use them. And these are basically the three things that you need to uh, successfully monitor and successfully use the open source and ML library, and also exactly in this format. Um, and that brings me to the end of the presentation. I hope you didn't like it. I, I saw some questions uh, popping up in the chat also. I'll have a quick uh, look at it while uh, Maybe my father can say some closing remarks. By the way, if you like what we're doing um, and you want to support us, uh, please do go to our GitHub page. Here's a QR code that you can scan. Uh, leave a star. It will help us with visibility and get our algorithms out there. Uh, so your support would uh, be very much appreciated. Awesome. Thanks a lot, William. What a great presentation. Uh, super insightful. Um, yeah, I just, before we go to the Q&A, um, I've shared this already a few times in the chat, but uh, William, if you can go to the next slide, we will have um, the link to receive the recording. There are a few people that already asked for it, and I already see some people leaving their e email information. So please, um, if you want to receive the recording by the end of this week, please let us know and um, we will send it um, as soon as we can. So um, I think we can go to the Q&A section, William, if you're ready and already took a, a break from uh, that, yeah, awesome presentation. So maybe we can start by addressing a few questions. Uh, from Emre, we have um, a question. Is it possible to check performance of the model without ground truth label? Do we need to label new data to check performance? So this was a question in the beginning of the webinar. Yeah, so I hope that right now that answer, that question is being answered. So you don't because we have algorithms that can estimate performance. Maybe I'll elaborate and give some um, assumptions that these algorithms make. So they will be able to deal very well with data drift. So that means distributions changing. But when the underlying concept is changing, that is still something today that is not incorporated as part of performance estimation. It's something we're working on. I do have good news though. That is that uh, of most of the things where we've seen concept drift in reality, it also coincides with some type of data drift. And that's also because there is an interaction between data drift and concept drift. Uh, so that is one way if, um, and data drift, how those um, changes impact performance are captured by our algorithms. So most likely some concept drift will be able to be picked up. And then also if you use the uh, multivariate data drift detection algorithms, they measure the relationships or take the relationships between the features into account. And if these relationships start changing, so when there is a lot of multivariate data drift, that might also be a clear tell that the relationships between your features and your target would be changing, which uh, is concept drift. Awesome, William. Thanks a lot for elaborating a bit on that. <clears throat> Our second question is from Maliki. So my primary use case involves a situation where I have past ground truth, but I do not have ongoing ground truth. This is explored extensively in the NaniML documentation. How does the process you're describing change if there's no ground truth compared targets to? Yeah, I think that that is the, actually the same question as before. So I hope I've answered that as well. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, let us know, Maliki, if you have any other questions, uh, please pop them in the Q&A if that's not clear. Um, so the next question, how do you do chunking with big data? 
Um, okay, so um, first of all, we have big data support coming on in Dusk. So that is going to be released in a few weeks. So if right now you have an issue uh, with running NannyML on very, very large uh, data sets, that is probably going to be resolved. Um, because we, do, and when it comes to big data, what the, what the main bottleneck actually is, is the fitting. So when you feed your reference to it, and then you fit your estimators. But we've added like partial fits where you can actually feed chunks and then fit per chunk and then update. So that is one way that we're already dealing uh, with potentially like memory constraints. And then the predicting itself from performance estimation perspective is actually quite cheap because it's kind of the same thing. Uh, for instance, if you take DLE, you create a machine learning model yourself on top, the on top of the machine learning model you already have. And then prediction is, is not that hard. And because we're already chunking, um, we're already like partitioning the data, which leads uh, very uh, efficiently for distributed computing. I, I hope that answered your, your question. Thanks, William. Uh, I hope it did as well. Otherwise, let us know. Uh, another question from Benjamin. For the regression example without ground truth, isn't that, uh, is that essentially the same as monitoring drift in the incoming features? The weights of the model stay constant. And so does the test set with these predictions and loss. The only dynamic var variable other are the features. Can you elaborate what the difference is? Yeah, so first of all, that, that's a very great, a very good question. And you're 100% correct. And what, what the only thing that this actually does is tying the changes inside of your input space of the features and mapping it to the performance. And the reason why that is so important is because there is, especially today, there's a lot of features that go into a machine learning model. Not all features are as equally important. And some features, when they change, the model is already being able to deal with it. Like for instance, if you have certain areas of the feature space where your model is actually fairly confident, and now all of a sudden there is other parts of the feature space that become more dominant in terms of input data, but the model also knows pretty well how to deal with them. It's not going to impact our performance. So, um, and when it goes to from a from a uh, very certain area to an uncertain area, it will. So, not all data drift is equal, and that is why it's, it's actually very important to translate this mapping. But in a sense, it is indeed today. As our algorithms stand, it is like just a better data drift detection algorithm. But in the future, we will also be adding the concept drift detection to it. Um, but doing concept drift detection when you have no access to the targets, which is uh, the case in, in, in most of the use cases, is extremely hard. And there's a lot of research that goes into it. But today, these algorithms themselves are already fairly performant. And that's why uh, we also uh, already open source them. Awesome. Thanks a lot, William, for the answer. Um, the next question is, how would you suggest to deal with the high model error variability that occurs as the age of the model goes up? Ah, yeah, okay. So yeah, that probably refers to um, the, the nature paper uh, okay. in the beginning. So uh, that's actually a great question because um, today, at NannyML, uh, there is um, there are some people that are using our performance estimation algorithms, not necessarily as part for monitoring, but also for selecting models. And and I'll and I'll pitch a use case where uh, some of our users actually have applied NannyML. It's actually this, which is uh, if you have very 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 big data, it's very expensive to train a new model. So one strategy to do is to take data from the past, train 10, 20 different machine learning models create a model registry or a model catalog. And then when you're about to make new predictions, this is in the, in the case of a demand forecasting uh, use case, where there is a lot of trends inside of the data and when maybe from one location to another, it's very hard. Also temporal forecasting uh, kind of becomes, is not that straightforward. So what you can do in that case, because training is very hard and predicting is easy, you could just with that month's data or that week's data, put it through all of the machine learning models, get your model output, and then feed that model output to 
the performance estimation algorithms of many ml and then they will estimate the expected performance and it is a way to then select which model is the most useful for you in the coming month or in the coming week and that is actually uh, because a, a real life example or a real problem of that model error variability going up because indeed if your models are aging you don't know how different types of model or different type of uh, model architectures are going to be dealing um, with the actual new data, just like it is described in the paper. And that is actually a very good question and just an example of how, how it can potentially be solved. Awesome. Thanks, William. Um, the next question is um, I have a model with a bunch of custom transformers in a scikit-learn pipeline. What do I monitor? What goes into the model or what goes into the pipeline? Um, also a uh, good question. Um, I would actually, it depends on what you're doing in your, in your pipeline. If in your pipeline, you're just doing scaling uh, uh, and you're maybe like creating some dummy variables, what you're doing is you're changing the data to become more interpretable for the, for the machine learning model, but less interpretable for yourself. And if you wanna do root cause analysis, what you want is that you actually have data where there is a lot of semantics presence and where you can see if you have to look at 20 different dummy variables, or you can look at one feature that actually has all of these categories presence, it's easier to actually understand the data drift. So I would say that you go for the semantic meaning first, because when you, are using the data drift detection algorithms um, to do your root cause analysis. That is what you care about most. Now, if in your pipeline, you're also creating some features, then you also actually might specifically want to monitor those because if you create like a very specific feature that might load a lot of information and might actually add semantic meaning to any of the drift. If you have four or five features drifting, but you can create an intelligent feature out of it, um, then that might also add more context to the actual um, data drift and, and, and why it's happening. So it's it's going to be use case dependent. Thanks a lot, uh, William, for that explanation. Um, our next question is not really a, a question. It's just a thank you from Justo uh, for the presentation. So <laughs> I don't know if you want to say something, but... <laughs> People are appreciative of the presentation. So thanks a lot just so for that feedback. We really also appreciate that you're saying that. Uh, moving on to the next question. How can we create an MLOps architecture with less hardware requirements? The main problem with MLOps tools is they are hardware intensive, like integrating an S3 bucket with our product. Is there a way to overcome this? Um, this is actually uh, an interesting question. Um, so we've we've seen other customers actually, or other users of NannyML that also have this problem where they're actually storing a lot of data and where they have to remove data because, for instance, the, the use case was uh, very sensitive data emails that they couldn't uh, store for a very long time just because of GDPR and they could only store it for a month. One of the things to do is if you don't necessarily wanna keep storing all of your model input and your model output is to uh, process them first and only uh, store the results after chunking, like the aggregated information. Like for instance, if you um, are doing uh, distribution calculations, what you would do is you would not store the actual array with all of the values, but you would store the function of the distribution. Same with performance estimation. Um, when you're actually doing the fitting, you can just aggregate all of the information, the entire array of your model outputs, and then only store the metric. And I think that that would be a way uh, of how you can potentially uh, have less resource constraints uh, on data storage that you actually use all of these aggregation and chunking methods to also eliminate the data that you need to be storing. Uh, also, as a side note, this data doesn't have to be stored in NaniML. You can just hook NaniML up to it 
and then it will fetch the data there as it does its uh, running job and then only store the aggregated data and the aggregated data is um, like reduced a lot so i hope that answered your question so William, uh, actually it's funny because uh, our next question is related to what you just explained uh, from Emre. Uh, how do you, Nani ML, have the data, features, prediction, targets to monitor? We need to integrate something into our code, training and prediction service. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to uh, our managed service that we're currently uh, building with our design partners, that is going to be uh, taken care of automatically, uh, where we will be doing some data collection potentially. Uh, but when it comes to the open source, there is two ways today that you can set up Nani ML is you can either integrate it or deploy it or have it as part of a notebook and then schedule uh, the notebook. Uh, and just when you're making predictions, you just store them, dump them on an S3 bucket and hook up into that. Uh, there is actually a repository on the Nani ML organization, uh, and that is about. I see a a, a very good a question. <laughs> Already a follow up from him, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, look, if you uh, want to be using the Nani ML uh, managed service, which we're currently uh, building, I would uh, you can reach out uh, to me, and we can discuss how we can uh, potentially become a design partner. How our pricing is set up right now is that for a ballpark pricing, because it's often not that straightforward in the sense um, we have right now somebody that we're monitoring their demand forecasting. And instead of having one model, they have 100 models. And typically, our entire managed service is about the multi model view. But if you want ballpark pricing, we've done research. Um, a data scientist spends two days a month monitoring uh, a use case. So you'll have, just have to multiply how many use cases you have with two working days uh, of your data scientists and then how expensive you are. And that for the time being is gonna be a good ballpark for how much uh, Nani ML would charge for. Awesome, two in one question and uh, great questions about Nani ML. I'm not sure, William, if you want to add anything else. Yeah, you seem like... Um, you want it to? No, 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 no. Okay. no. Go ahead. We can go <laughs> then, to the next yes, question. Yes, I will read. Uh, yes, the next question that we have here. Um, so, can this be used with any library in which model is being trained? For example, modeling done using pandas or SciPark. Does it affect the monitoring using an EML? Um, no. So, so the library itself it's completely model agnostic. Uh, we just fetch the, the features and the model outputs and how the modeling is doing being done or how the model output is created, what you use for that, that doesn't matter. Uh, and that is also a specific reason that today we're not uh, fetching the model file because um, that makes Nani ML just way more scalable and way more widely apl applicable. There are some advantages that you could potentially have to having the model file. Uh, which is like you could retrieve, could retrieve uh, feature importance or shaft values or do some simulations with it. Uh, but the funny thing is, if we have a good reference data sets, and it is the test set, and that test set is large enough, we also have the target there, we also have the predictions and the model output. And what we could then do is build shadow models using the test set and then leverage shaft values from there. And that is kind of going to be in the future when we add more complexity to, and also for, for instance, doing concept drift detection, um, that is going to be the way that we will probably uh, do more advanced analysis while still staying model agnostic. So I hope that answered your question. Yes. Ah, yes. <laughs> we already have a confirmation. There's a thank you for the answer. Um, uh yeah, I also actually see in my chat there's some some people that um, asked some questions uh, to me directly. I don't know how late it is, but uh, I, yeah, we're, we're a little bit over time. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep going. Uh, the question is, why don't you use the training distributions as a reference for data drift, and same as performance estimation? Okay, so specifically for performance estimation, we need a test set in the sense that. Um, 
if we are going to use the training data that's also being used to train a machine learning model, and then all of our analytics later are going to be slight because we're calibrating probabilities, we're training another machine learning model. So ideally, that is not on the same data as the machine learning model is being trained on, because then we're just going to induce overfitting. So that is for performance estimation. And when it comes to um, the, 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 the data drift detection, so uh, the thing about the training data is that, that you actually might have very different distributions in your training data. Uh, and the whole idea is that also, for instance, if you look at um, specifically for when you build image models, you're augmenting your data um, and you're doing lots of different things to have as much data as possible. And then you let kind of your model decide which patterns and also which data points are potentially relevant for your problem. So if we then gonna be using that, um, that is not gonna be as representative. And, and a, maybe a good example is like, um, like a year ago, there was a, a, a computer vision company in Belgium that they had a, like a nice use case where they would use a camera inside of a supermarket to kind of detect um, which fruits and vegetables were being weighed. Uh, and when they trained their machine learning model, um, uh, and when they deployed their machine learning model in production, they were seeing that the predictions of carrots were really going up. And that was because the hands would show up uh, when the cashier would put uh, the fruit or vegetables inside of the, the weighing scale, which was not part of um, their training and their development setup. Uh, now, ideally, if you would create such a use case, you would go and get real production data and real real life scenarios of uh, your fruits and vegetables inside of your test set. And then you can use all of the data of the internet where you just scrape bananas and where you scrape oranges and all of the food to kind of give a lot of information uh, to your machine learning model. But you would ideally already represent that data inside of your test set. Um, and then your test set is going to be representative for the production. And then if it's different, then you will establish, uh, you will see the issue. Um, okay, there's a new question popping up. Does Nanny model work with image recognition model? If so, how? Yeah, so the performance estimation algorithms, uh, both for regression classification and multi-class, they do. Uh, regression uh, doesn't, sorry, because it takes into the features, takes into account the features of the machine learning model. So you'll probably have to either uh, feed it the last layer of your neural network or whatever your... Uh, you're, you're using are the last few layers that there is some data science, uh, some type of feature set to be extracted so that the model can learn from. But when it comes to classification, that works out of the box straight away. So for, so for getting a view on performance, it works. For data drift, it becomes a little bit more complex um, in the sense that you will have to do some map mapping to some tabular data first, uh, because today NaniML only works on tabular data. Uh, but like like I said before, you can maybe take like the layer before, uh, or if you um, pass inside of your layer also some semantics, maybe even the last layer, or if you're doing transfer learning, that because the, the most important thing is if you convert images to like the tabular format, you like kind of lose um, potentially what it means also with neural networks themselves. Um, like if there is data drift, you actually want to understand it, uh, and then. Adding a semantic layer in, in between is the way to use it with NaniML, but also the way to kind of go and understand uh, what's going on with your data. But it will require um, some custom transformations, yes. So not out of the box uh, for data drift detection. Awesome. Um, thanks a lot, William. Mm -hmm. uh, there are no uh, more questions in the Q&A section. Um, so I think we could uh, start closing our webinar for today. I'm not sure if you want to leave some closing remarks, William, and then uh, I will jump and say goodbye to everyone. Uh, let's just say goodbye because we already went 10 minutes over time. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for attending. It was a pleasure. 
Uh, we're organizing these webinars on a regular basis. There's always a lot of people showing up. So we are for sure gonna be doing that. I keep doing that and stay tuned for uh, the one webinar that's coming soon on uh, business impact monitoring.